Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Shooting the Shit Uncensored. As again, I am your host Piers Austin and today I am joined by a very, very special guest. A guy that I've been wanting to talk to for a while and I'm really glad that we'll be able to make this happen. Uh, you know who he is. His name's Garrett Bischoff, former TNA Impact wrestler. Uh, he's also the son of, you may have heard of his dad somewhere along down the line. But uh, before we get into that interview, I just want to take a very special moment to thank a few of our sponsors before we get into it. First off is Signal Studios. Signal Studios is a recording studio based in Sydney, Australia. It's run by my good friend, Rafi Tomassian. If you're a pro wrestler, you want a new entrance music, he'll be able to create it, ship it out to you anywhere in the world. If you're in Sydney, you're a musician, you just want some place to jam, hang out, practice, whatever it is, go down there. He'll be able to hook you up and give you a great space. Next is Mayan Belts. Mayan Belts make the best championship belts in the world. If you want a custom championship belt or you know you want a replica of your favorite championship belt, head up my good buddy, Eddie and Ira Williams on Facebook, and they will take care of you. They will give you a great deal. They have payment plans, and they are, the, like I said, they're the best in the world at championship belts. Now, my last but not least sponsor is A-Rock Designs. A-Rock Designs is run by my friends Kevin and Ashley Rodriguez. They make custom, oh, Ashley makes custom cups, hoodies, t-shirts, keychains, you name it, they make it, all with a wrestling theme, but also doing stuff that, you know, is, you know, moving away from that wrestling theme to sort of expand their business. So please, guys, go check out my sponsors, support them, and uh, yeah, you'll get some great products. But guys, without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Garrett Bischoff. GB, what's going on, brother? What's going on, everybody? Man, I'm really excited to be talking. Man, it it, uh, it looks like it's uh, nice weather there, man. You got the singlet on, so we're in the middle of winter. So you guys must be warming up for summer, correct? It's brutal hot right now. Brutal hot. Hot and humid. Dude, it's brutal cold right here, man. It is free. I, I'm freezing my t- I'm freezing my tits off. Like I, I won't <laughs> lie, but uh, you know, I digress, man. You know, <clears throat> I live in one of the warmest places on earth, so I can't complain too much, man. But how you been, anyway, Garrett? With everything that's been going on, and 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 with COVID, and and obviously protests that are happening over in the states. Um, how are you and your family doing? We're good. Um. <clears throat> Uh, we were talking a few minutes ago, you know, other than a few minor inconveniences. Uh, but for the most part, everybody's good. Everybody's safe. Everybody's ha- uh, healthy, happy. Um, you know, my wife owns a salon down in Tampa. So that side of the things has been affected a little bit. Um, but so is everybody else's. So we're just doing what we can to, you know, to tough it out and get through it. And, and uh, that's other than that, we're good. That's it, man. So, were you born in 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 the Florida area and 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 grew up in that area, or where did you, where did you born and grew up? Yeah. So, uh, my sister and I both were actually born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, we were there for a short amount of time. I want to say around seven or eight years old, and then in '92, when my dad started with Ted Turner, that's when we moved down to Georgia, and uh, we were there for ten years, eleven years. Um, up through my sophomore year of high school, and then we bounced out to Arizona after that. And just I've been kind of moving around ever since. Yeah, nice. And it, was that something that you, you just sort of got used to doing as a as a kid, like moving place to place, or was it, it was it pretty hard for you guys to sort of uplift? You know, obviously, you know, as a kid, you make friends, and then you sort of get up, and and then you move. What, what, did you find it difficult? Well, so I was too young when we left Minnesota. I was too young. Yeah, you know, I didn't have any established friends at that point. Um, and my sister's a little bit younger than I am. Um, leaving Georgia was tough because it was smack dab in the middle of high school. Like I did my freshman and sophomore year there. And of course, you know, your friends and your freshman and sophomore year of high school, that's your, that's your friends for life. That's your, you know, that's everything at that time. Yeah. That's what you think. Um, so getting pulled out of that was a little, that was a little tough. There's a little bit of a, a rough transition there, uh, but I adapted quick and, Realized that it was much better <laughs> when I once I got out of Georgia and, and out to Arizona, um, and then as you know, as as you get older, you start to realize that you you know you make friends anywhere. Yeah, uh, it's you know, yeah. it doesn't matter where we go. So and and thankfully, looking back on you know, I have friends all over the place now: Wyoming, California. You know, I mean, hell, all 
all states probably. Well, that's amazing though. And before we, we go any further, Kevin Rodriguez, uh, a good friend of mine and, and now obviously a friend of yours as well, Garrett. Uh, he says, you look like you've been slinging back ghost peppers. So I don't know what that is. I, I'm guessing it's a drink or, or it's a chili or some. some yeah, sort, ghost so. peppers. I grow them. They're, um, they're <laughs> super hot chili peppers. Oh, Actually, yeah? I just harvested a plant, so I have about 15 of them in the fridge. Ooh, nice, nice. You use them for cooking or just knock them yep. back by themselves? No, not by themselves. Those are, I mean, I'm tough, but that's not like that. That's, that's a little weird. <laughs> uh, I like to – it just depends. Uh, if we're making like a big pot of chili, we'll put one in there. Or um, what I like to do is I have a mix of peppers. I have a lot of them around here. It's one of my my secrets that no, nobody knows about Garrett is I like to – I like to – you know, I like to garden um, – but we do all kinds of different things with them. We, we dehydrate them, make different shakes or salts with them, and use them for cooking. Some of them we eat raw, just depends. Yeah, nice. So growing up, were you were you always a fan of wrestling, or was there like did it was it something that grew on you over time? I, uh, I guess I was an instant fan because I was thrusted into it. That's yeah, you know. Um, but it wasn't like a normal fan you know i i mean it's kind of a yeah. tricky question like i'm i'm a fan of musicians um and i'm a fan of i'm a wrestling fan obviously but it was different uh so i guess to answer your question yeah it was it was pretty much right away once my dad got into it because i would he would bring me in the offices and i'd get to see all the behind the scenes stuff and um that intrigued me that that's kind of what really sparked it did you feel, would you feel like obviously seeing all the behind the scenes stuff, it, it sort of lost a little bit of the magic for you? Like, or were you just sort of more, that's what you've known at such a young age. It's just, it, it is what it is basically. Yeah. You know, it was a different kind of magic. Um, mm. I, I can't, it, it, no, it did not take the magic away. I got to see things from a different perspective, um, which got my brain working. So I would start to, I guess, uh, analyze things differently when it came to that side of the business. But it did, definitely never took the magic away. If anything, it kind of made it more because you got to kind of see how how magic was created. So, you know, in, in, a, in a different kind of way. Oh, you know, absolutely. And, you know, growing up, you know, as, you know, who your father is, Mr. Eric Bischoff, you know, you know, he was he was obviously the heel, the bad guy in that sort of late night, the mid to late nineties area. Oh, era, I should say. Sorry, but uh, how was it for you, like growing up in in high school, and you know, everyone of clearly knowing who your dad is with the same surname. You know, did you get like, did you experience a lot of bullying, or did school sort of kids sort of try and take it out on you? And obviously, for them not knowing and understanding the pro wrestling business for what it is. Yeah. Or was it more like they cool that? Why like, was it like, oh my God, that's cool? Both. So there was both. There was, um, you know, there was my group of friends that thought it was just, you know, that was really cool. Yeah. Then there were the, you know, the small crew of people that all of a sudden they were your best friend every time wrestling came to town. You know, <laughs> I was like, oh, I haven't talked to you in a year, but hey, you know, we're best friends now. Um, yeah. But then, there, of course, there's, all, there's, you know, there's haters everywhere. Um, so yeah, I got. I got that. You know, like, oh, you're just this, you're just a spoiled rich kid, you know, and just they say you don't know me. It's not that's not who I am. It's not how I act. Um, yeah. But you know, it is what it is. You get that everywhere. Every everybody gets it. So you just deal with it. Yeah, no, hundred um, percent. We do have one question um, from Kevin Rodriguez. He just wants to know: Is are you Garrett Bischoff or Jackson James? I'm I'm pretty sure you were Garrett Bischoff, but <laughs> depends. I got stripes on. And I'm Jackson James. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So, but you know, when you wanted to break into you know the wrestling business, how old were you and and where you really thought you know what this is something I want to I want to dip my toe into and, and go go in and and give this a try? I think I was probably end of middle school, beginning of high school, so. 13 ish, 14 ish, when I when I can actually remember going, all right, I'm going to do this. Um, and that's when I started getting in the gym and working out and, you know, protein shakes and all that. And all that is, uh, <laughs> I can remember, I remember asking my mom to go take me up to the local nutrition GNC or whatever it was and 
I needed a, I wanted a blender, my own little blender bottle so I could start making my protein shakes because I was going to take weight training classes in high school. And that's kind of when it, when it clicks. So. Yeah. You got to get those vitamins, brother. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have got a, a question from uh, the audience. Uh, my good friend, Gene from Canada. He wants to know what's been, what was your favorite match in TNA? Man, you know, I've been asked that question a lot. Um, it's it's really hard to say I, to have a one favorite. Um, we we'll probably get into this as we go here, but I had sure. such a great opportunity to work with so many awesome people at TNA in a very short amount of time. Mm. Um, so to to pick just one is um, I mean, it's next to impossible. Um, I'd say one that stands out the most is probably the lockdown match where it was my team versus my dad's team um, where he beat the living hell out of me with a cane stick. And then I ended up racking a guitar over his head for the win. Um, <laughs> so that one probably stands out the most. Um, Cause that was kind of a, that was the, the, the period at the end of the sentence, that was kind of the established. Okay. Now, you know, here I am. Um, but as far as a favorite, you know, it's just, it's hard to say. Yeah. And to go back <clears throat> to what you were saying, you know, when you were 13, 14, started working out and, and really realizing that you wanted to be a professional wrestler, what was the take when you told that to mom and dad? What, what were their opinion? Were that, was it like rolled, eyes rolling in the back of the head or was it more like slap on the back and go, all right, boy, let's do it. Let's get you the training or was it like, oh, I don't know. Well, at that young, it was more of a, we'll talk about it in a couple of years, you know, and then I, as I got older, um, and it was getting a little bit more serious. It, my dad, my parents didn't want me to do that. Um, you know, being in the business as long as my dad has been and seeing what happens and how unstable it can be. And, um, you know, it's tough. It's, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy for any second or third or fourth generation um, kid coming up. It makes it harder. Um, and it's not the wrestling today is not what wrestling was in the nineties, it's a completely different ball game. Um, so he definitely did his best to steer me away from it all the while being supportive. So my parents have been always been supportive of my sister and I, um, anything that we want to do, if it, they know if, like, if that's what we want to do, that's what we're putting our mind to. They got our backs and they've always been that way, but they definitely tried to go, mm, maybe not something, something else trip your trigger. <laughs> Well, I think it's probably the thing, and as you said, you know, your dad's been in the business for, for many years and, and has seen the best and worst of it, I'm sure, and it was probably more, if you're going to do this, go in with your eyes open and, you know, make sure don't be so vulnerable, And but was, was there any ever point where your dad said to you, hey, look, you know, I've created a lot of friends in this business, but I've also created a lot of enemies, was there ever any fear that, you know, you were going to get in the ring with someone um, that may have had a... I don't want to say difference of opinion or, or thought any differently of your father that you, the fear that they may take liberties with you in the ring. Was that ever a concern for you? No. I mean, the thought crosses your mind all the time. Um, independent circuits, especially because you never know. Um, I can take care of myself. So I'm, I never, it never worried me that somebody's going to try to do that because I, that, you know, I, I know how to take care of myself. Um, yeah. But no, and that's one of the things about professional wrestlers. You may not like somebody in real life. You know, we, 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 people may not like me. I may not like them, but out there we have a job to do. Yeah. Um, once, once you step, once that music plays and you step through that curtain, you put differences aside and you're out there and you do your job, you keep each other safe. Now, does it happen? Has it happened in the past where, you know, you, you get that rogue agent that wants to take a Liberty or two. Sure. Um, never to me. Um, so not to say it can't happen, but 99% of professional wrestlers, they know that you, know, you got a job to do you go out there. If you got beef with someone, you want to handle it. Let's talk when we get back through the curtain in the locker room. Um, but out there we have a job to do. And everybody respects that. Yeah, no, uh, that's, that's amazing to hear. Like it, cause you know, you probably think probably years prior, it may be a little bit different where, where someone might stiff someone or <clears throat> just give them a little bit of, Oh, sorry, man, you moved. Why'd you move? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, you know, in, in this day and age, I think it's probably changed a little bit more, but 
you know, <laughs> out here and there, is a you know, that's that's one thing. Um, but putting someone in, phys you know, in harm's way is another. You know, you get a stiff shot here and there, let someone know. That's one thing. That's no big deal. That's just that's just camaraderie. Yeah, but you know, that, it's funny. About a, uh, last week, I got to sit down with. Um, uh, Epico Cologne um, from the Cologne family and one of the things he said was you know being from a famous wrestling family it'll open doors for you but the moment you make make a mistake those doors shut very quickly and a lot quicker before anyone else is would you agree with that statement sure absolutely um, yeah. it's, it, this business is it's a hard enough hill to climb as it is um, it's twice that if you know coming from a, a, a family that has been in there because people a lot of people think that they have or they're gonna have preconceived notions. Um, so they're gonna they might be a little irritated that or think that you're getting a, a spot that you don't deserve because of your name. Um, so right out of the gates that can make it tricky. Um, but yeah, no it's it's I think that's that's true too. Yeah. How did you, so you were trained by Gangrel, you know, he, he's one guy who, you know, big name from, from the Attitude Era. Um, how did you get linked up with him and, and what made you go to his training school as opposed to, you know, somewhere else like the Dudleys or, or another program? Was that where you were sort of pushed towards or was that the guy that you sort of found that you meshed well with? No, so it was actually um, Rikishi school out in California, but Gangrel was one of the coaches there. Um, it was Knox Pro Academy. That's where my first wrestling school was. And they brought me in and we had discussed with them that we didn't want anybody to know who I was. I wanted a fair shake. I wanted everybody to just expect, you know, accept me for just another kid that was trying to learn. Um, so they knew that going in and they respected that. And uh, they took uh, took me in with open arms and they were phenomenal. Um, Reno, Rikishi and, and Gangrel, they put... They love it. They love to teach. They love to coach. Um, it's it's a it's their passion. So um, I'm grateful, very grateful that they took me in and and helped me out as much as they did. Um, and we're still friends to this day. You know, we still talk all the time. Uh, and then after that, I came to Florida, where I finished some training with Nasty Boy Brian Knobs at his school. <laughs> that would have been interesting. You have no idea. <laughs> how did you how did you find like the different styles of training though i mean you know gangrel rikishi brian knobs you know what was how were the differences with it you know were there one was there one trainer that you sort of uh meshed better with that you sort of vibed better with that you learned i wouldn't say learned more from but that you had a, a stronger connection with where you yeah let's say that you picked up more from about the business from that trainer no, not one more than the other. They're just very different, uh, which is what you're looking for, because uh, there is no one correct way. Um, yeah. So I was lucky to build a grasp from each of those coaches. And, you know, some of the things uh, I'd be able to, some things worked for me, some things didn't, but I could take what did work for me from each coach and then kind of mold it into my own, so to speak. So it wasn't, not one was better. They're just different. Yeah, no. Uh, we got a question from uh, Brandon Randall. Uh, he wants to know, did you ever get to hang out with some of the guys in the back? I'm going to assume he did. Um, and if so, who really stuck out for you and made an impression? So this is obviously when you were a child, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, okay. Well, uh, um, I guess as a child, um, one, one that always sticks out. So Rick Steiner taught me how to play gin rummy. So every time I used to be on the road, I'd go in the locker room and, and he and I would sit back and, and play gin rummy in the locker rooms. <laughs> so that, was, that was always fun. Um, I have a lot of fond memories of, of, of a lot of guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like once again, so so many I could sit here probably for the next two hours and, and talk about it. But that would be the first one that pops in my head. Yeah, like, you know, I can just imagine Big Papa Pump sitting there with a child playing uh, gin rummy. Yeah, yeah, the big bad booty never, daddy just beat your ass, boy. <laughs> I never played cards. I never played cards with Scott. I always played with his brother Rick. Oh, Rick. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep. Well, apologies. So, um, one of the things uh, that Kevin just wants to know: what tools did you pick up as a referee that would ultimately help you as a wrestler? Ring awareness. Yeah. Um, reading, reading what's going on. 
Um, so that was also a very cool opportunity to, to have. You learn, I learned so much doing the referee thing first, um, communicating, moving around, what's going on, timing. You know, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen in a very short amount of time um, in that ring. So being able to have the opportunity to see it from that perspective first was was huge. I think, you know, it's, it was a very cool opportunity. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously to, to have that sort of space to go in as that referee, no one knowing who you are and then sort of learning your way in the ring, but also in front of a live crowd that, yeah. that TNA was getting at that stage. But Charles Redman, who's a, a good friend of mine, he just wants to know, um, He'd be interested to hear your opinions on Vince Russo. We hear that what Eric had to say, um, but he's interested to hear what Garrett's feelings are. Do you have a have you had any contact with with Vince, or you ever dealt? With I him? had I had a very very I mean like a half a cup of coffee's worth of contact with Vince Russo for the very short amount of time he was at TNA, and I mean like months if that. But I yeah. never actually dealt with him personally, other than passing and shaking hands and saying, "Hey, how are you?" Or, eating lunch and catering. I, I've never, I've never really dealt with them. So um, the world, the wrestling world knows that they don't like each other, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't know the guy very at all. So I, I really yeah. have no opinion. Yeah. It's not, you, you don't have a dog in the fight essentially. Nope. Yeah. So coming into TNA, like how did, how did that sort of all come, come about? Like, obviously your dad was part of the, like the creative and part of the, the company. Um, you know, was there any reservations from him to bring you in or was it, you know, how, how did that come about? How did you get involved with TNA? Yeah, there was, there was uh, plenty of reservations and that kind of goes back to, Hey, do you sure this is something you really want to do? Cause it's going to be a, it's going to be a crapshoot. You know, he, he's, you know, he, he made it very clear that it was not going to be easy at all. Um, but I was, I was had my head set on it. I said, well, I'm going to at least try if, if, if I fail or if it doesn't go anywhere or if it only lasts a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years, then that's what it is. But at least I can say I, I, I tried. Um, so that's how we, I mean, essentially that's how we, we started the conversation and then that's where the referee thing came up. So let's, Originally, it was more of a storyline. Let's, let's bring you as a referee, and then we can play that card six months down the road, and it'll be this huge, big, cool thing. Um, but it, it ended up being actual beneficial. <laughs> so I learned a lot along the way as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, it, it, that's, how kinda, that's how we got started with the TNA thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, starting out in TNA and, and with the whole uh, immortal storyline and yeah, you, know, you and and your dad having th th those sort of tense moments, and I think you know e everyone growing up, and I think you know, like I I've always had a good relationship with my father, and by the sounds of it, you've you've always had a pretty strong relationship with your father, but you know, getting the opportunity to to take a couple of uh, to shots at him, <laughs> you know, it was like this is for grounding me, like back in nineteen ninety eight. <laughs> but uh, you know, how was it to be in the ring with, with, with your dad and, and to, to experience that live crowd with, you know, face to face with him? Was that something surreal for you or, you know? Absolutely. Uh, and that's that was one of my biggest things. You know, I grew up watching what he did and what he helped create. And I always wanted to be a part of that with him. You know, I was always around it, but I wanted to be a part of it with him. So that was one of my, you know, it was one of my biggest things. Um, so having the opportunity to not only be involved with wrestling, but have the, do it at a time where we could be involved together. Um, yeah. That was huge to me. That was huge for me. And yeah. we had a lot of fun. You know, my dad and I, we, we have a lot of fun traveling together. You know, we, 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 we get along real good. We're best friends. Um, so being being on the road together and having fun and and doing the wrestling skits and even though he beat the hell out of me with a cane stick, you know, I, I, <laughs> I deserved it. I'm sure. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> it's it's funny. I was actually watching a, a few um, TNA videos last night on YouTube, and uh, I saw the, uh, the the this one clip where Gunner brought you out to the ring and pile drove you or or set you up to pile drive you, and then your dad comes out. No, no, no. Rips the mat up, 
you know, you take the pile driver and then you load it up on the ambulance and yep. you've got, you know, Ric Flair slapping your chest going, come on, big man. That's you know, part of it. <laughs> like, no, I, I, could actually, I could actually see you, you know, trying to sell the injury and you see, like, you know I, mean? I was like, man, if someone's slapping my chest, I'd be like, fuck, dude, stop that shit. Oh, you know? oh it's brutal because you're all strapped down. I can't move. I can't do anything. Yeah. But like, obviously, you know, in, in that moment and, you know, to be working with someone like a Ric Flair and, and obviously your dad and Hulk Hogan and, you know, and the immortal roster that was in that stable, it, you know, it was a massive uh, achievement for, for anyone breaking into the business and, and, and that early on. Was there anyone that sort of took you backstage and to sort of really give you that advice and that guidance besides your dad? Um, to really sort of help guide you and, and sort of give you the, the tools and the information that you need to improve as a worker? Sure, sure. Um, a lot of guys did. Um, Rick Flair being one of them. You know, he, 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 Rick Flair is another one. He loves to teach. Um, he, would, he would be waiting back there for us and he would, you know, he would critique us and, and tell us, you know, what we did right, what we did wrong every time, advice. Um, Devon Dudley and Bubba Ray, they were the same thing. They're so good with psychology and they love to teach. Um, so they were always there for us, uh, or for me and many others. Um, I mean, the list goes on. I, you know, I had the opportunity to work with so many great people. Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle was huge with that um, yeah. and had a lot of great matches with him. A lot of bruises, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of sore body parts. Um, but had tremendous matches with Kurt and same thing. He loves to teach. So uh, being able to be around those guys and have the opportunity to hear what they have to say and then pass on their knowledge was, was incredible. Yeah. Anyway. And, you know, and, and your matches with Kurt were, were phenomenal. And, and especially I remember sitting there watching going, wow, for a guy that's sort of just breaking out onto that national level, the matches were insane. You know, Kurt Angle could can have amazing matches. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I really, I really enjoyed the matches you had uh, with him, and I really liked the way that you came in into TNA, and and also, you know, you sort of were partnered up with Wes Briscoe. But you know, what was the sort of um, the thought behind putting you guys together? at the start was it because it's like oh here's a couple of second generation guys these guys will work well you know we can storyline it or did it just sort of happen organically with you two um you know I, not being a part of the creative team i don't know what the original plan was there if there was one or not obviously two second generation kids there's that um that's nothing new though uh, it started out as the gut check where we, um west came in and did the gut check match with me so we were both uh, baby faces essentially and then i think it was kind of a timing thing um that's right before the aces and eights started kind of firing up there was an opportunity there the referee thing then i was you know i turned on my old man and then i was the good guy and then here's this opportunity for me to you know go ahead and stick it and you know do the bad guy thing so i think it was just timing really i don't know if there really was a master plan in there it just kind of worked yeah and you know you, you mentioned the the aces and eights and turning in, into a heel and to be honest aces and eights to me is one of my favorite stables in wrestling history and you know the reason why i think it was just the concept of it was so cool you know mm -hmm. it, it was such a really really cool concept and i think that that to be honest as a fan's perspective and you know i am a fan i am a big fan from a fan's perspective i think they could have done a lot more with it personally um you know, how did when did when was the decision to include you in that? Was it always from the the get go? They were saying, "Hey, look, this is the long term plan that we have for you. We're going to put you in this stable." Or was it pretty much like last minute going, "All right, who can we put in there? All right, you go." No, I think it was more of a long term plan because um, I was one of the originals with you know from probably the second or third debut of when everybody was still in masks. Um, I became one of them. So we started to use that. And of course we would, you want to leave a little bit of, you know, you want to put it just enough out there to make people go, mm, no, nah, eh, mm, maybe not. So I think that was a little bit of a, a lot more of a part of a long-term plan. Um, but I agree with you. I, they, they cut it short, unfortunately. And that was just when it was picking up steam. So when aces and eights came out, 
wrestling hadn't really seen a stable like that since the NWO. Yeah. You know, um, that kind of raw, nitty gritty, um, pushing the boundaries, even for these days, kind of, mm. kind of stable faction. So it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, and it got a lot of attention very quickly. Yeah. Like one of the things I really enjoyed about it and it was the fact where Devon was revealed as a member. And I remember like every wrestling fan was going, Oh, he's, he's done with TNA. You know, you know, he, he went out, you know, as the television champ and he's going to sign with WWE as a, as a backstage agent. And then boom, that up, like, you know what I mean? Like it was almost like, um, back in the day as a kid, like I said, during that attitude era where you would see like a big reveal or something mm -hmm. like that, that was, that actually took me back to my childhood, that whole storyline. And that specifically was like, Holy yeah. The, internet wrestling, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the internet wrestling community was like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it catch you by surprise. It's hard to do these days. You know, everybody knows what's going on. You know, the curtain's been pulled back and everybody sees what's in David Copperfield's bag of tricks. And it's hard to it's hard to get people in like emotionally invested. I mean, everybody knows when they're supposed to cheer. Everybody knows when they're supposed to boo. Everyone knows when they're supposed to clap, but to actually get people emotionally legit, emotionally invested, it's hard to do these days. Yeah. And, and you, you said that a hundred and I agree a hundred percent. And it, it even comes down to, to the cage match where, where bully was revealed and like the crowd was like, that was old school heat. And the whole way that it was done, it was just, it was smart booking. It was smart booking for a lot of it. And man, I was during that time, I didn't watch WWE. I was tuning into TNA every week to see what Aces and Eights were up to. It, 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 I was hooked. I, I was hooked, man. You know, and I'd even go back and watch the episode twice, <laughs> twice in a go. week. I was that into it. Um, you know, but, you know, being in that situation, like, you know, you, you were working with guys like Bully, Doc, uh, Ken Anderson and stuff like that what would you say are some of the best bits of advice that you you would have gotten from some of those like say someone like bully who, who's been around he's pr essentially done it all what's been some of the best advice that you were able to receive from someone like him or a devon or even a ken anderson yeah you know and ken and i are very good friends to this day as bully and devon and i are too um some of my you know i've had the opportunity or fortunate opportunity to create those relationships and and keep them even after we're done or i'm done um so Awesome guys, um, but to you know, I, I know that's a tough question because depending on what the situation was that they're giving advice about, it'd be different. You know, I mean, it's not the same advice every time. Um, other than just go out there and react, stop trying to think about what you need to do. Just react. To what you, you know and whatever it is that you need to do will just come naturally at that point if that makes any sense yeah no 100 percent. and that's and, and all those guys are great at that you know they're they can they can run improv all day long and be fan, you know phenomenal at it so um that, that's probably one of the better takeaways yeah, so we just sort of take a, a pause for uh, Kevin Rodriguez, who says, Garrett, to this day, your interview is one of my favorites One well, favorites I've done. Thank you for supporting Pierce and myself. You're a class act. And I have to agree, you're very much a class act. <coughs> besides, what Kevin, besides what Kevin told me about you, it's all good, man. I don't believe him. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, but, you know, being in that situation and, and being in that, that sort of impact and, and going through with the aces and eights, what was your favorite moment of being a part of that stable? What was the one part that really stuck with you as, as something that you'll, you'll remember for the rest of your life as, as being a standing achievement? The, well, it, well, this wasn't my achievement. The one, one of my most favorite moments with the aces and eights was when we were over in the UK and bully won the belt that night. And there was so much heat. So remember I grew up watching the NWO yeah. watching them throw all that stuff in the ring and how hated they were and fans afterwards, like waiting by the cars and throwing crap at cars and yelling. Like they actually literally hated people. Right. Yeah. Cut to, you know, two decades later, and here I am in the UK, 
And I said, this wasn't my match. This was Bully's match. But we were all involved in that match at, at one point. That After he won the belt, that ring filled up with so much crap. They were throwing everything they could throw. And I just remember being in the ring and getting this big old <laughs> grin on my face. Like, I'm not supposed to smile right now, but I can't help it. Um, that's probably one of the most standout moments uh, that, that I have from that. It was, it was a lot of fun. Man, I remember that match, and yeah, it's it's that that as I said, that old school heat that that, that yeah. aces and eights were able to get, and and sort of that riling up. And to be honest, I think that's probably you know Bubba's best work. You know that singles run in TNA to me is is, is some of his best work. You know, great. And he, he, oh, dude, he's such a dick. But yeah. you know what, like. You know what I mean? Like at that stage, I've been a wrestling fan my whole life, so I understood the heel babyface thing. And man, I, I was the biggest mark for aces and eights, and I was just like, "Bully is like the fucking man." Like I was like the, the Brook storyline and everything like that. But the one thing I liked is with that, you you guys all seem to work well as a stable. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, was there ever anything? like any thoughts to bring anyone else in like who controlled who came into the stable was that something that was done by bully or did you all of you guys have an opinion or a say when they wanted to bring people in or take someone out or was that just 100 percent creative i would say probably all creative now mm -hmm. obviously you know guys like bully and devon who have been around and are very their opinions are very well respected so did they put their two cents in i'm sure they did if they did i'm not aware of it um, yeah. or if it had any influence, you know, whatsoever. Um, but to my knowledge, that would be all, that would be all creative. Yeah. And I think as well, like it, it was good to see a couple of young guys like yourself and Wes go in there and, and, you know, to me, like, you know, to, to give that sort of a little bit of a rub, I, I would have liked to have seen it do a little bit more with you guys. Um, just cause I think it would have been, you know, made for more compelling television, you know, like it, mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's just my opinion. I'm not a wrestling booker. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a, you know, a couch booker or what do you call it? armchair booker? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I do it all the time. But yeah, I digress. But you know, how often are you wrestling now, Garrett? Are you still on the scene? Are you still? No. Um, you know, every once in a great while, if there's a, a small independent show somewhere close, um, charity or uh, you know fundraisers or something like that, I'll I'll do something. Um, but I don't, I don't stay in the ring enough anymore to essentially be safe. You know, I, my timing's not what it, you know, what it was. Uh, my reaction time is not what it was. Uh, footwork isn't up to par. You know, when, when you're in there with people that you the person you're in there with is relying on you to protect them. Um, so it's, it would be unfair to other people for me to get in there and really do, a, you know, do too much. You know, we still like to go out and have fun and we, we keep it, the ones that I do, we keep it real simple and real easy. Um, but I don't do much of it anymore. Yeah. I mean, was WWE and ever, ever an opportunity for you to, to go there and go to NXT and, and do that training with them? Was that ever, was the door ever open for you or was that ever a conversation for you? You know, when my contract, my last contract ended with TNA, I, I was 30. Um, my wife and I were just getting ready to buy a home here in Florida. And when it, when it came to an end, I knew, you know, could I have got into NXT? Probably. I never, honestly, I never tried. Um, but I had kind of had to make a, a decision. Um, I wasn't young anymore. Young, you know, 30 years old. Um, I kind of had to make a choice. You know, yeah. I, I try to start this over and really go for it again and maybe it not work out and spend the next 10 years, you know, trying and trying. And then what? Um, or do I count my blessings, enjoy the ride? I, you know, I was fortunate to have and and move on. And that's that's what I chose to do. Yeah. Another question from uh, Kevin Rodriguez. Uh, he wants to know. Oh, so, uh, when the aces and eights ended, were you able to keep your cut? And for people who don't know what a cut is, it's the leather vest that uh, MCs wear. I do still have it. I'm one of the only ones that did keep it. Nice, nice. Did you put it up in a frame in, in your office? It's in, at my, home? it's in my closet. It's hanging up in there. Oh, uh, dude, that's, that's something to frame, man. Put it up. They, they did try to take it, and I told them they could try. And that didn't work. 
<laughs> really? Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't let you guys keep those though. Like it's yeah. What else they're gonna do with them? Sell them. Yeah, fair enough. Probably. <laughs> well, I guess that's why Impact Wrestling, you know, is you know, no. But I still have them. Yeah, no, well, that's awesome that you got to keep yours though. It's uh, you know, but you know, moving into you know where you are now, and and how did you feel when you left TNA? And as you said, you know, you 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 still do a few independents there. Were you still wrestling on the independents, and did that slowly wind down, or was it once you left TNA, you were like? I'm I'm done. Like this is I I need to focus on a new chapter in in my life right now. No, I I ran the independent circuit for for a while after that. Um, up until last year, actually, uh, Wes Briscoe and I were tag teaming here in Florida for a uh, promotion by the name of a um, ARW, and we actually were their tag team champs for a while for almost a year. Uh, we we're is that that. Atomic Wrestling? Yeah. yeah, yep, Atomic Revolutionary. Yep. Um, so, and we had a ball, you know, we, you know, it was fun. Um, like I said, it's close to home. So I was able to do it. Um, able to kind of get back in the ring and scratch that itch and hang out with the boys and, and, and be a part of it still. Uh, but once again, it just got to the point where, you know, I have a, I have a job and yeah. I can't, that job is what pays my bills. Those, those shows don't, that's for fun. So I had, you know, like I said, I'll still do them once in a while, and everybody's great. Um, I, but I got to make you know, comes down to family and paying bills. I got to do what's right. No, a hundred percent, and uh, I completely get it, man. It's uh, as as much as it, you, you'd love to get in there and do it. You know, you've got a family to look after, you've got a family to support, and and mortgages to pay. So. Yep. But um, Garrett, look, it is that time of the interview. Um, I did mention to Garrett earlier, guys, that's right. It's time for the Aussie slang game. So how this works, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give an Aussie slang word. I'm going to use it in a sentence. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun here. Um, now, Garrett, are you a easily offended guy? No. All right. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. No. Um, <laughs> um, all right. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been to Australia? No, I want to. All right. Well, no, actually, I have family in Australia. Really? I have cousins there on my mom's side, yeah. R whereabouts? I don't know. I just know they're in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll find out and I'll get back to you on it. <laughs> All right. So here we go. All right. So we're going to go, go a couple here, right? Um, the word's bogan. Oh, mate, that bloke down at the pub was a bloody bogan and a half. What's a bogan? An asshole? No, it's it's kind of more like an Aussie redneck. So a bogan, someone who, who would really talk like this. Hey, go on, mate. Yeah, just going to go down to the fucking pub, have a few schooners, maybe have a flap on the horses, you know what I mean? You know, have, there you go. You know, get, tell that Sheila to get me another schooner, mate. Yeah, all right. A bogan. Yeah, a bogan. All right. I'm going to use some of these when I go to work next week. Dude, absolutely. Well, when you come to Australia, you'll, you'll at least understand the lingo, my man. That's right. You want a sausage sanger? Sausage singer? Sanger. Sanger. Sandwich? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a sausage sandwich. So essentially, it is the greatest thing in the world. And all it is is a piece of bread, a cooked sausage, straight in the middle of it, a bit of tomato sauce or ketchup, as you guys call it. And it, man, it, it goes over like Rover. Hmm. That sounds good. It's getting there. Yeah, mate, that'll be a piece of piss. Piece of piece piss. Cake, easy. Yep. You, you're good at this, man. I can see that you may, you, I think maybe you've had a co conversation with some of those Rellos in Australia, mate. So, <laughs> oh, mate, I'll tell you what. That was a bit of hard yakka, that was. Hard, hard. yakka. Hard work, hard project, hard. Yep, 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 yep. Man, see, I got this. Hey, Garrett, that was a long drive, mate. Where's your dunny? Bathroom. Dunny. Yep, toilet. You're really good at this, man. All right, <laughs> you, you, man, you're, you're doing well. All right, so I've got another one for you. Hey, mate, before you come over to my house, can you go past the bottle o and grab me a slab? Liquor store, what? rack of beer. Fucking 
Oh, Jesus. Oh, man. You, you're really good at this. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up. Oh, mate. I was feeling a bit dusty this morning. Hung over. Fuck. Um, right. I, 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 yeah, man. I, I'm going to try and get this harder. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll tell you what, mate. I saw that chick down the road and I cracked a fat boner. Fucking hell. All right. <laughs> Jeez, you're, you're... Hey, mate, would you like a Bicky? Bicky. A pinky? Bicky. B Bicky. Icky. Bicky. Mm, beer? No, it's a it's a biscuit, kind of like a cookie. So. Hmm. All right. All right. Uh, Hey, you better watch out for the booze bus. Uh, the police. Yeah, so it's usually like a police. DUI. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. DUI. They'll have guys waiting up. Like, all right. So let me go on a couple more here. Oh, mate, you see my mate over there? He's a bloody banana bender. Gay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That, no. 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 A banana bender is uh, what. Australians refer someone from Queensland from. So my dad's family is from Queensland. So you know my mum's side of the family go, oh you're you know, you banana bender family members, you know, because it's like that's where mainly a lot of bananas are grown. So right. <laughs> I was um, on a good you you were on a good roll, man. You're on a good roll. Okay, so I'll tell you what, mate. I overslept this morning and my wife had to get up with the kids and now she's been cutting sick. Cranky, like um, yeah, get, you, getting, angry, angry. Getting, getting angry, firing up, yeah, yeah. firing okay. up. So, all right, so I'm gonna go a couple more. Hey, Garrett, would you like a durry? Maybe. What is a durry? <laughs> Have a guess, man. You tell me. What's what's a durry? Uh, cocktail. Uh, no, it's a cigarette. Oh, yeah. So in that case, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm I'm a reform smoker myself. That's why I got this little bitch. Got there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got a couple more here. All right, mate, what do you want for brekkie? Breakfast. Fucking hell, All right, mate, you were you were too good at this. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go one more. Actually, no, we'll go two more. Oh, dead set. That guy's a drongo. Drunken, belligerent maniac? <laughs> no, kind of like a dope and idiot or, you know, or something along those lines. All right, kind, of so a, kind of a putt, a little turd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. So, all right, I'll go, go one more. The word's cobber. G'day, cobber. Cop. Police. No. Cob, cob. Like corn on the cob? Cobber. What's a cob. cobber? I don't even I don't even know what to <laughs> I don't even know what to guess on that one. It, it, it means like a, a friend. It's more of like people in the older generation, like probably like our grandparents' age, something like that, would say, Oh, get a cop here you going. Like people our age would just go, What's up, mate? Or what's up? Our version of what's up, brother. Yeah, yeah. What's up, brother? <laughs> All right, so I'll go one more. Bloody oath. Bloody oath, that was a good match. Bloody oath. Uh it seems, I mean, it's a compliment, so hell yeah, that was a good match. Um, yep, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good match. Yeah, right. yeah that's, that's exactly what it is. It's Man, right. you know what? I have never, and I mean this, I've never had anyone get more correct than you have. So I think when you come to Australia, you are going to be fine. You've been given the Australian thumbs up, and you are an honorary Aussie, my man. You are an honorary it. Aussie. So when you I come to Australia, it. man, I'm going to take you to a couple of pubs, and uh, then we're going to try and fool some people and see if we can get them to think you're an Australian. But uh, like Garrett, before we wrap this up, man, um, why don't you tell everyone uh, where they can find you, where they can follow you on social uh, media and and all that good stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, Twitter and Instagram are both the same. It's at Garrett Bischoff. Nothing fancy. One R, two T's. Um, and Facebook's, I mean, Facebook's the same. So uh, um, they're... I don't, I'm not as active as I used to be, but I try to keep everybody uh, up to speed with what's going on and, 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 you know, keep some stuff going on so everybody knows what's happening in, in the day in the life. That's incredible. Yes, but, uh, 
Garrett, thank you so much for coming on. Pardon me. Also to our live audience, thank you so much for tuning in yet again for one of my interviews. I really appreciate it. Garrett, I, I thank you so much for you to give my give up some of your time to come and speak with me and to speak to our audience here tonight. Guys, we'll catch you next time. I'm Piers Austin. That's Garrett Bischoff. Say hi to your mum for me, and we'll catch you next time. Uh, Bye, Piers, man. thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening. Thanks very much. Catch you next time, guys. See you soon.